Hello and welcome to this uh, Angelati pop-up studio here at the EU Sustainable Energy Week. I'm now joined by Paul Hodson, who uh, works for the European Commission uh, and is the head of unit for energy uh, efficiency. Uh, Paul, welcome. Uh, thanks for making the time to the studio. I, I know you're speaking at a, at a number of events and will have already experienced some. Um, we were talking a bit off air and to get to the point of energy efficiency, it seems to me, and I'll, I will make this statement so that we can explore the issues either side, that some of the regulatory framework or the regulatory framework that's in place now doesn't do enough of a job to reward energy mm. uh, efficiency and in incentivize mm. energy efficiency mm. as well. I think that's partly true and partly not true. We work with member states and quite a lot of them work through energy efficiency obligations on utilities either DSOs or electricity suppliers, and they will get savings among their consumers, which is a bit counterintuitive because their incentive structure would presumably be to sell more energy. To sell more energy. In a, so yeah. it's been possible within the existing regulatory framework to introduce those obligations, which actually work. They're one of the most powerful ways of obtaining uh, energy savings in, in buildings in the residential sector. Where it's truer is in the demand response side. We would like, for efficiency reasons as well as other reasons, to encourage peak shifting, to encourage people to adapt their consumption to uh, electricity market prices. And because people don't perceive those prices, they don't have the incentive to make those changes. So, so this is where, again, you know, and, and we've talked about this uh, on Angerati, where a number of issues clashed and there mm -hmm. you know there, uh, there is and there was a recent article about this in the economist as well where uh, th there I there is a need for cost reflective tariffs and uh, the removal of uh, uh, of subsidies uh, but that also clashes with some of the you can't decouple energy from politics that mm -hmm. you know how much of that do you want to expose mm -hmm. I is that one of the sort of main things why uh, the sort of demand and peak shifting isn't mm. happening uh, in terms of being able to expose those tariffs? No, I think the, the, those are two different issues. Whether or not tariffs are regulated is one question. The other mm. question is whether um, tariffs are higher at peak times and lower at off-peak times, which can happen in more or less regulated pricing settings. Mm. Um, doesn't tend to happen very much at the moment and yet it's clear from the point of view of the electricity system as a whole that we have every incentive for people to choose to reduce or transfer their consumption at times when the when the, when the price is high and again in terms of peak shifting mm. uh, you know this is clearly something we want to have happen yep. uh, so how can we facilitate that and make it happen. I mean, mm. I, I'm not saying uh, right now that uh, uh, y you know we, we've got one answer. But if you can just ex mm. explain a little bit, you know, what your office mm. is exploring in terms of the mechanisms to make that easier. Yes, indeed. So we're talking about situations in which um, appliances, for example, freezers would go down to minus 18 when the wind is blowing, or would be allowed to cool up to minus seven or whatever the, s the safe maximum is when the wind isn't blowing those sorts of arrangements. To make that happen, you need smart appliances which can receive the instruction to change their behavior. You need a link to the grid via a smart meter or some other method so that the instruction can be sent. You need rights for consumers and rights for data protection and all of those things which will make people feel confident to join in the system. You need, because each of us can't negotiate that individually, firms can, but individuals can't, you need rights for aggregators to sell that peak shifting into the balancing market or wherever, and you need the incentive which will come from the differentiated pricing. So you need a whole set of different things. Yeah. We're working on the um, appliances, we're working on the smart grids, we're working on the rights for aggregators, we have some legislation on that that's just coming into force. We're working um, on the uh, data protection and standardization issues. It remains to be seen whether that will lead this to start happening, that will lead the price differentiation and the entry of new players into the market to happen or not. In all of those examples, like low-cost flights, mm -hmm. the common denominator there is people are exposed 
to the tariff. Mm. You know, they're exposed to the volatility of it. You know, they, it, 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 and that changes behavior. They, uh, you know, I know that if I want to buy a low cost thing, uh, flight, if I do it three months beforehand, I get it cheaper mm. than when mm. I do it mm. after. And th there is an issue within the energy market. I mean, certainly in the UK, mm. for mm. example, where you know the politicians are saying actually you only need four tariffs, mm. whereas for that model to work, you don't need four tariffs. So you need one tariff, maybe can be just the variable tariff. But you need to expose that to change behaviour, don't you? I'm saying that indeed yeah. there yeah. are potential rewards for people yeah. if they um, consume at times which it suits the system for them to consume. I think the method of doing this can needs to be as part of a greater extension of information and choice for people as energy consumers. I receive one gas bill a year. The last one was three thousand euros. Exactly. I mean that doesn't tell me anything about how to change my behaviour. And you compare that with your phone bill and the level of differentiation of information that we have. So by moving people closer to that, using some of the powers of new technology to uh, switch on devices remotely, that kind of thing. I think there's plenty of room. Also moving to controls which people can understand better than we have at the moment. It's not a model of giving over control of your home to another party. It's rather a model of empowering you to take that control and to benefit financially from it. And, and there are all sorts of other players who are not traditional energy players that could play a role in there. You yes. know, you, you've got uh, Google's recent acquisition and what yes, they're doing. Yes. And that must be quite interesting as well. It's very exciting to see how this market will develop and who, who will be active in it and to what extent there'll be people who are already like DSOs who are already very present in the, in the sector. Uh, exactly. And, and we uh, just to broaden the con uh, conversation out because mm. the, you know we are, uh, you know the, these are 15 minutes interviews and we're, we're coming to the end of our time but you know we were talking off air and w we've spent nearly most of the interview talking about electricity, electricity. Uh, it's not all about electricity <laughs> it's about energy mm. um, and, and what are some of the other things that you're seeing within the energy mix mm. where uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation about joining up all the different facets mm. to make an energy mix. Mm. Uh, but I'll, I'll let you talk about some of the things that you've mm. observed, m maybe not just in this energy mm. week, but mm. uh, g generally. Mm. What we see um, over the last few years is that we can now say energy efficiency policy works. So it used to be a bright idea, but nobody was sure that it could actually deliver. But we're now seeing data which shows these policies are delivering. It's true that the recession has led to reductions in energy consumption, and we regret that. But it's also true that the reductions that we are seeing are far more than would be explained by the recession alone. What um, works less effectively within that is in the transport sector. Apart from CO2 emission limits for cars, we have relatively few powerful tools in the transport sector. Where we're powerful is in industry, and particularly in the buildings sector, which means at a time when we're concerned about gas consumption for security of supply, that efficiency is one of the most powerful policies specifically to reduce gas consumption. So, uh, especially in the building sector, we've seen the, the, the things like the, the passive house mm. movement, mm. where, uh, what was it, like 18 pounds and my house is heated for, mm. for the whole year. Uh, you know, that, uh, that seems to me like a massive area of saving. I mean, yeah. it, it yeah. doesn't take a genius to say, I mean, not saying we can do this. If you, if all of London were a passive house, mm. you know, mm. for example. Mm. But okay, mm. I mean, it is a major technological step forward. Houses, new houses, are so different in their energy performance from what they were even mm. ten years ago, mm. and that's brilliant. And most of the houses that are built, most of the buildings that are built in the next years, won't need any energy significantly. But seventy-five percent of the buildings that are going to be standing in twenty fifty are standing today. Yes. 80% yeah. of the buildings that are standing today were built before the early 90s, which was when building codes started to come in in a significant way. The real problem is reducing the energy consumption of existing buildings, and there you can't just knock them down and start again, or we don't want to knock them down and start again. I was going to say you could, but <laughs> you could. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> you could. It's and not there be we need yeah. the same technological innovation in terms of modulization, in terms of insulation, which is a lot less thick, in terms of uh, better heat pumps. We need the same technological innovation for new build for existing buildings that we've seen for new buildings. And we need that technology to come down to an, uh, a level of affordability exactly. as well, so that exactly you can. I mean, the cost optimal level of refurbishment. So how low you push the building's energy consumption when you refurbish 
goes down each year, but it's still nowhere near the cost optimal level of energy consumption for a new building. Which while we still need things like the Green Deal, yes. uh, and I'm not going to go into whether that's been done well or done badly, but, but it's a brilliant. I mean, we can only do this mm -hmm. with. Uh, private money. We can't do this with public money. Mm. The Green Deal is, a, is at the cutting edge of innovation. I know it's difficult to achieve some of those things, but it's absolutely in the right area. Mm. And I hope that the British continue with it and continue finding solutions to the areas which are... Well, I think that, that, that some of the complexity of it needs mm. to be mm. removed. Yes. You know, I, I, I've tried to go down mm. that route, and it's, it's daunting. I think it's mm. perhaps over bureaucratic but again that's yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a personal view and that's a good just before we f uh, finish off what you know what about waste no one talks about waste but it's part of the energy mix as well there's some you mean really waste, you mean <laughs> the, 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 the rubbish yeah exactly yeah. yeah yeah i mean we uh organic waste is if it's used for energy, it's renewable energy. It counts towards our renewable energy targets, it's eligible for subsidies, all the rest of it. It's a really sensible use of stuff which would otherwise be lef left to rot. Mm. And particularly better than putting it in landfill, where you get all sorts of methane emissions. So, yes, we encourage that. And, uh, and I've also seen some very interesting things about use of uh, you know, uh, gas production through, uh, yes, through things indeed, like that. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. So uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for bearing through the issues w w we've had. You, you probably won't uh, uh, see that in the final uh, edit, but it's uh -huh, always, a, uh, always a challenge when you have a pop-up studio. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, thank you as well for watching. This is uh, one of the many uh, interviews we're running at uh, uh, the EU Sustainable Energy Week. Thanks. Thanks.